talking about uh, proximal humerus fractures and uh, shoulder dislocations. Um, I hope I've pitched it right, uh, but do ask any questions if I've um, said something that doesn't make sense or you want clarification. Uh, if you put it in the chat or in the Q&A, uh, then we can answer that at the end of each section. So it's in, it's in two halves, essentially. The first half is on proximal humerus fractures, the second half is on dislocations. Um, okay, so let's get started. Obviously, that's not working. Okay, a little bit about me. Why you know why why you should listen to me? Um, I graduated from Manchester, did a master's in Cardiff, did most of my training in, in Manchester before getting my number in London on the pot rotation. Uh, I've got a PhD on rotator cuff uh, augmentation. Was president of Bota many moons ago. Married to a GP called Marlin, and I've got two kids. And I love golf, orthopedics, and snowboarding. Um, so the objectives of the first half are basically to cover a little bit of anatomy of the proximal humerus, um, a little bit about fracture patterns and classifications, uh, appreciate the pertinent clinical features when you're basically seeing a patient with a proximal humerus fracture in A&E, for example, or in fracture clinic. Um, I'm going to cover a little bit about the treatment options available, but it's not too in detail about exactly the technical aspects of how we fix the, the, a lot of these fractures. Um, and then I'm going to cover a little bit of evidence um, on, um, on papers that I think are relevant to this field that help guide what we do. So starting with the anatomy, I hope this works. Okay, great. So you can see the proximal humerus there. It's got some knobbly bits on it. There's a bit at the front called the lesser tuberosity. There's a bit on the side, which we can see now called the greater uh, tuberosity. Ah, and, um, and you can see there's some important bits that attach onto this, which will be um, present shortly. Between the greater and lesser, there's a bicipital groove, which the long head biceps runs. And obviously you've got the humeral head. So as we can see in this model, we're putting in some muscles and you see the muscle at the front, which is the subscapularis, <clears throat> which is one of the four rotator cuff muscles that attaches onto the lesser tuberosity. And there's a muscle at the top, which comes attaches onto the kind of that superior aspect of the GT. And that's the supraspinatus. There's a muscle at the back, which is the infraspinatus which attach onto the back of the GT, and then you've got teres minor at the bottom. Um, so the first question, if Charmani could put that up, um, is this statement true or false? So the arcuate artery is a branch of the posterior humeral circumflex artery that supplies a large head, a large portion of the head. Is that true or false? Give that a few seconds. I'm sure the results will pop up. I'm not sure if they will on mine because I'm sharing screen. But if uh, oh here we go. So oh it's, it must be a good question because half you got it wrong, half you got it right. So hopefully the next slide, if I can just get rid of ah one sec. There we go. Um, this slide will basically shed some light on this. So don't be too overwhelmed. Essentially, you've got an anterior and a posterior um, circumflex humeral artery, and they ba basically come off the axillary artery. The anterior is more important than the posterior, but they do form an anastomosis, or it's thought to form an anastomosis. Considering this is anatomy, there's still a lot of debate about exactly what's going on um, in terms of blood supply to the, to the humeral head. It's very different to the uh, femoral head, where there's a lot of consensus. Um, but this is thought to be quite a common pattern. So you've got these branching vessels from the anterior uh, humeral circumflex. And I just want to draw your attention to uh, the structure label B, which is the long head of biceps tendon, which is basically going between the lesser tuberosity and the greater tuberosity, which is um, labeled there. And there is a very important blood vessel, which is number five, which in this specimen goes underneath and deep to the long head of biceps and ascends. It's also referred to as the uh, anterolateral ascending branch of the anterior uh, humeral circumflex artery. And that then pierces the humeral head at a variable <clears throat> location in the greater tuberosity and then branches off and, and, and supplies most of the humeral head. So uh, that's very important, but it's also important to remember that, um, uh, come on, that there's a lot of variation. And in fact, what I just showed you there only really represents 36% of the, of, of, the, of the cases. So actually there's seven known variants um, described in this. 
And this is important because occasionally one of the variants, it runs in front of the long header biceps. So why am I telling you all this? This is a bit esoteric, right? Um, Yeah, why? Why am I why am I telling you this? Why am I learning about this on a on a uh, Thursday evening? Well, that has some relevance because when you sustain a proximal humerus fracture, you have to be very aware of the blood supply when you're performing an operation where we're fixing the fracture, because if you then violate the blood supply, just like you would in any other bone, just like you do in the, in the hip, that bone will die and the patient will have avascular necrosis and have a bad outcome. And I'll explain why that's relevant later on when we talk about management. But essentially, just be aware that there's an arcuate artery, which is a branch of the anterolateral ascending branch of the anterior humeral circumflex artery, not the posterior, which is uh, what the question said. So the question was false. And um, that there's a lot of variation between where it bifurcates, when it ascends, and its relationship to the long header biceps. Most of the time, it goes deep to the long header biceps. I'm not sure what's going on, but my uh, remote's not working. Let me try my, okay, I have to do it manually. So <clears throat> next thing you need to know is how you classify proximal humerus fractures. And there's a chap called Charles Nair, who's thought of as being the godfather of shoulder surgery in North America, quite a charismatic New Yorker who did a lot of work in shoulders in the 60s and 70s. And one of the things that he put out there was this classification system. And um, he basically, looked at the common fracture fragments and split it up into the number of parts. And there's like 16 different um, parts of the classification. So it's very confusing for a lot of people. Um, but for those that get grilled in the trauma meeting about near classification, the thing you need to know is he arbitrarily defined the fragment as being a part if it was displaced more than a centimeter or angulated more than 45 degrees. Uh, and he said that's 45 degrees from the anatomic position, but uh, People get it wrong all the time, but essentially it's one part, two part, three part, four part fractures, and there are a number of different variations. And so the parts that he described were the greatest tuberosity, the less tuberosity, the humeral head, and the shaft. Um, and this is relevant because um, the more parts there are, the more likelihood that the vasculature is at risk. The more parts there are, the more likely that there's been a lot more force or there's a lot more osteoporosis present potentially. And the more parts there are, the more likely you have a, an associated uh, humeral head dislocation, which is one of the absolute indications for uh, an operation and people who are fit for general anesthetic. Um, don't worry too much about this because the reliability of this classification is not very good. Um, one thing I do want you to, um, to uh, take away from this talk is this classification, which I think is fantastic. There aren't many classifications in orthopedics which are useful. This one's very good, if not only just to allow orthopedic surgeons um, to communicate very quickly what the what the fracture configuration is. So this is done by Ralph Hertel in 2004. Um, it's called the Lego classification because in his paper he had this diagram which elegantly describes um, uh, the, 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 what it's trying to show. And what he essentially did is he looked at all of these fractures that he was treating in Bern in Switzerland and came up with this classification and um, but he tried to correlate these different um, patterns, there are 12 in total um, from five fracture planes. He tried to correlate that to intraoperative uh, perfusion um, of the humeral head with a view of, of hoping that that will somehow predict which of these patients get avascular necrosis. So if there are, you know, for example, if, if fracture number 12 is really high for AVN, it's not worth fixing uh, a lot of those patients because you know they're gonna have bad outcome potentially. That's what he was hoping to find. And what he basically did was drill holes in the humeral head, uh, put a yanker sucker on the, on the head, underneath the head itself and see if there's any back bleeding from the drill hole that he made at the top. And if there was, he deemed that to be a perfused humeral head. And the select group patients, they also did laser flow uh, Doppler uh, flowmetry um, and, and demonstrated that there was some flow going on in the, in the humeral head. But what you need to know is that essentially, similar to near, there are common fracture um, uh, planes and patterns. And so the red brick here is the humeral head, the blue brick is the GT, the yellow brick is the LT, and the green brick is the shaft. And so you don't need to worry too much about this, but there's also a nomenclature associated with this where you basically put a dash in between where there's a, um, a, a disconnect between fragments. So for example, um, fracture pattern 12 would be 
H, which is head, dash G, which is greatest numerosity, dash L, which is less numerosity, dash S. So you can write it out, G dash, uh, uh, sorry, H dash G dash L dash S, and everyone knows exactly what you're talking about. Basically, nothing's touching each other. Nothing's uh, in continuity. Um, okay, and what he basically did in his paper is he tried to quantify whether the fracture pattern or type of fracture correlated to um, uh, perfusion interoperatively by using these drill holes. And I want to bring your attention to this bit where he basically said, if you had an anatomical neck fracture plane, right, um, or you had a very short calcar extension fragment, which basically means the neck on the medial cortex, um, that was a very short fragment that was attached to the humeral head, um, or the medial periosteal hinge was disrupted, um, that, that was highly likely of not being perfused at the time of surgery. Um, and he correlated that with some stats here. Now, if you think about the vasculature that we just talked about, everything comes in from the medial side and anteriorly from the anterior uh, humeral circumflex artery. And so all of these things, anatomical neck fracture, a short calcar fragment, and a disruptive medial hinge all imply that there's something that's happened during the trauma to potentially disrupt everything that's going on with the blood vessel that's traversing that, that area. So that's where the blood supply becomes, becomes relevant. Shamali, my um, talk is not advancing. I have to click it every time. That's okay. Um, however, don't get too excited because in 2008, he basically followed those patients up and found that some of the ones that he said were not perfused in theater ended up um, healing without any AVN. And some of the ones that did have perfusion um, in, at the time of surgery went on to have AVN. And what he then described was doing the drill hole thing made no difference but the classification still stands the test of time. So you can't necessarily predict who's gonna get AVN at the time of surgery, but um, the classification is still, uh, still useful for, for communicating. And for those of you um, thinking about applying for the pot rotation, this is Ralph Hertel here with some um, phenoms of orthopedic surgery, including Freddie Fu, Mohit Bandari, Andy Carr, um, and Professor Rajasekharan from Ganga with our um, former pot secretary uh, PJ and our TVD, Mr. Achan. And so he actually came and talked to us about proximal humerus fractures. Um, so if you're interested in the pot rotation, you get to uh, have regular conversations with absolute giants of the field like this. So let's talk a bit about how these patients present. So if you have a proximal humerus fracture patient, you get called to a &E, you could quite easily come and see Doris, who basically fell at home. She, she missed the step or she tripped over the rug or her walking stick gave way and she landed from a standing height directly onto the shoulder or something similar um, or you could end up um, with this person so that you know this is some Tour de France um, cyclist I don't know who it is but you can see that guy really decks it on the hard tarmac at high speed this is just before the final sprint and then all of his teammates go with him um, so that those two mechanisms can both yield a proximal humerus fracture but those two patients and those two fracture patterns can be potentially very different and the associated features on on presentation um, may be very different than what you're looking for. So you need to think about if it's a high energy or if it's a potentially lower energy, but in a very elderly person, then consider an ATLS approach, right? There's no harm in putting out a trauma call and going, you know, look, you know, I know this is referred to me as a proximal humerus fracture, but I think there's, there's more that is going on here. You know, this guy came off at high speed on his bicycle or this elderly lady fell three steps and she's 90. She could easily have a femoral fracture, pelvic fracture, a head injury, et cetera. Um, and so consider that uh, doing a full primary survey, doing the full ATLS, calling the trauma team, et cetera. In a low energy fall kind of mechanism, still look for associated injuries, especially in the elderly. They can still have NOFs, they can still have a head injury, they can have a neck cervical spine injury if they've hit the head as well. Um, so always look for those. Don't just assume, oh, this is an isolated thing because the a and SHO has taken such a good history. Always, always examine the neurological states of the arm. And in particular, you want to look for the auxiliary nerve because that can take a bit of a beating. And, then, and especially if the humeral head dislocated and relocated, um, the auxiliary nerve may have been stretched temporarily leading to a neuropraxia. And that's quite, quite often the case if you look for it. And very occasionally in the elderly, they get an infraclavicular brachial plexus palsy. So they've got no function in their hand and elbow often, uh, post ganglionic brachial plexopathy usually. Um, and most people just don't look for it. Right? They think that, you know, the injury is up here at the shoulder and they don't examine the hand for neurological status. 
And so that's really important. Um, so what else was I going to say? Vascular status, yeah, always check the pulse. It takes two seconds. Um, I've been involved in two cases of a simple proximal humerus fracture, an elderly person who um, actually had a um, uh, impingement of the brachial artery, not auxiliary artery. And, and that's one of the absolute indications to have an operation. And then the thing that you want to think about is, is the head dislocated? You know, have a think about that. You can often get a picture of that from the contour of the shoulder, how it looks. You can also get a, a, an impression of how painful it is, how much movement they have even with a fracture. Uh, but a lot of the time that's based on the imaging. So you may get an x-ray like this and you may see this kind of proximal humerus fracture. So this is you know, just below the, the neck. This is called a surgical neck of humerus uh, fracture. Um, but if you just get this, you know, and, and the radiographer says, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, the patient's in too much pain to do an auxiliary view, which is where they have to abduct the arm. They just can't do it, it's too painful. Then, um, then always get a Velpu view, all right? Their Velpu view or the Wallace view is basically where they just recline the patient 45 degrees and they shoot a vertical uh, X-ray beam straight up and down. And it gives you a, what's called a modified auxiliary or a Velpu view. So just ask for that whenever you see that. If you don't get a good like lateral or a good scapular wire, that's not clear. Just ask for a Velpu view. I request it all the time for these fractures and it's very helpful. And why do we do that? We do that because we need orthogonal views so that people can, of, uh, we can uh, triangulate the fracture and really understand what's going on. But very importantly for these is to um, rule out whether the head is dislocated because that completely changes the management. You know, you can have um, an elderly fragility fracture scenario. It's an isolated injury. The patient's had a simple fall and you can be sending that patient home to fracture clinic right? In two weeks time, if your fracture clinic is super busy. If, but if the head's dislocated, that's a completely different scenario. That patient's getting admitted, they're nil by mouth, they may even have surgery that night, okay? Um, and in that case, the, the same case I showed you before, that's exactly what, what, what happened here. Um, and this is your Velpu view, and you can see the head is, is completely um, uh, dislocated out here. I'm not sure if that's going to work. Can you, can you guys see that? I'm not sure. Um, okay, I'm going to move on. So essentially, if you get quite rubbish x-rays, you can't quite see what's going on, you know, how many parts of the fracture is the head in joint, I'm not quite sure. They get a, have a low threshold for getting a CT. Honestly, there's, um, we're quite lucky at the Royal London where I'm working at the moment. We can get CTs very easily. A lot of places it's very difficult. You have to argue with some reporting radiologist who maybe in Australia who doesn't want to get up and, 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 and report it a CT radiographer that may be at home, but actually you're doing these patients a big favor if you can identify that the head's dislocated um, rather than coming to the clinic, having another x-ray and demonstrating that, you know, week down the line where, where it's a lot harder to treat. It often helps identify the fracture pattern, but actually a lot of the time you can, you can, you can see that on the x-rays. You don't really always need a CT for that, um, but it definitely helps identify the degree of displacement, which can have an impact on, um, on, uh, on how we uh, potentially would manage these injuries. And it's really good uh, if the x-rays are open, as I said. Ah, this is not working. So top tips for ED, I, I tell this to everyone. And it, it, the patients often think I'm a bit crazy. Um, and I tell them again in clinic because they forget. But I tell everyone that even though you've broken the arm up here, you're gonna get bruising and swelling from here all the way down to all of your fingers. And not everyone gets that, obviously, but I tell everyone that they will all get that. And the reason why I say that is because so many of these patients come back day three, day four, day five to a &E and go, my hand is black, right, and purple and bruised, but my injury is up here. Can you x-ray my hand? And, they, you know, if you would have just told them from the beginning that gravity is going to bring all the, all, all the bruising, all the bleeding down to your fingertips, they will know that and they will know to expect that over the next week or so. The other thing to say is I often find patients tell me the first one, or one week or two, it's miserable, mainly because they just can't sleep. Because when you sleep, you exaggerate the deformity. They often get an apex anterior deformity. And when you're lying down, that gets even more exaggerated and it's very painful. So I always tell patients, consider sleeping in a chair or with lots of pillows uh, for the first week or two. It's a lot more comfortable than lying in your, in your, in your standard position. So question poll number two. Um, it's a true, or another true or false, dead easy. Um, ORIF, which is open production internal fixation, yields a superior outcome uh, to non operative treatment in um, the majority of proximal humerus fractures. I don't know why. When you share a screen, I'll lose my cursor. So I can't, I'm going to have to, um, yeah, there you go. Let's do that. 
So a few minutes to, to answer that. And hopefully we'll get the uh, answers to the question poll up shortly. A few more seconds. So fixing these fractures, is it superior? False, oh, fantastic. So yes, so the vast majority of these patients do not need an operation, all right? Um, and that's, uh, that's important to know. And we're gonna cover why shortly. Ah, oh, God, I'm really having a struggle, a struggle here. Right, so one thing to say is that there are obviously a, is a spectrum of how we manage these patients. So for some, it's a no-brainer, right? If you're young, active, you've got a very displaced, completely smashed up proximal humerus, there's a good chance that an operation, putting the pieces roughly back where they should be, is going to be helpful for you, right? If you have a polytrauma and you've got ankle fracture, tibial fracture, whatever, pelvic fracture, you're going to really struggle to use crutches if you don't have a stable shoulder to, to mobilize on. And so polytrauma is another a relative indication for an operation. Open fractures, obviously, um, but they're actually very rare. I don't think I've ever seen an open proximal humerus. Open humerus, very common. Open proximal humerus, not very common. Um, neurovascular injury, obviously, if there's no brachial pulse, no radial pulse, disc vascular limb, you've got to go straight away. Do not pass go. If there's a, a, plex a plexus palsy or auxiliary nerve injury, it's a relative indication. You're going to be discussing that with your seniors. You're going to be discussing it potentially with the peripheral nerve injuries unit. Um, but for a lot of people's minds, that's, um, that is a, a relative indication for an operation, if, especially if there's an obvious cause as to why they've got a neurological deficit. Not always. And if the hair's dislocated, unless they're very, very frail, they're going to have an operation. On the other end of the spectrum, very rarely do, do some people need an operation. So they're very frail with the heads in joint. No matter how bad it looks, if you, even if it doesn't heal, if you get a pseudoarthrosis, they, they don't get bone-to-bone -bone union, actually a year to 18 months down the line, they get pretty good function. The pain eventually subsides and they can still use that. I still remember one of my bosses uh, who works at the Royal London, he showed me an x-ray of this non-united uh, surgical neck of a uh, humerus fracture. And he said, what are you gonna do? And I jumped in, I was like, I would do this, delta pectoral approach, bone graft, you know, uh, stability, feel us play, described all of this. And he goes, right, go see the patient. Saw the patient, this lovely 90 year old lady who had like full range of motion, no pain. And I just looked a bit silly because actually a lot of the time these patients can adapt even when the thing doesn't heal. Uh, but it does take a very long time to get to that point. Um, if they have, if they're a medical train wreck and they're just going to die from the, the, the idea of a general anesthetic, then clearly they're not going to have an operation. And if they're totally undisplaced, even if they're young and very super active, I would recommend operating on those patients. Uh, so, and there's actually in the middle, it's a very large gray area. So the fragility fracture and the active independent elderly person, which is actually the majority of these injuries in most hospitals, or the valgus impacted, which is relatively stable construct without much displacement of the tuberosities. Again, a lot of people say, you know, you just leave those, they'll be absolutely fine. On, on the flip side, so the varus fracture is thought to be one of the indications for pushing surgeons towards an operation, but it hasn't really been borne out in the literature. That's more kind of level four evidence. But ultimately what happens is the surgeon, the patient decide to get their weighing up what the fracture looks like, what the patient wants, and ultimately what the evidence suggests for these injuries. But often there's no obvious answer. There's no, this, is, this isn't like a, you know, black and white, easy MCQ answer. Oh, you've got to do this or you're not going to do this, right? Um, a lot of the time it's a lot of gray. Uh, and a lot of the time we impart our own biases on, on, on patients in, in terms of managing these patients. So let's talk a bit about uh, treatment options. So you've got a um, uh, ORIF, which is traditionally a philos plate, which is proximal humerus uh, internal locking osteosynthesis plate, um, which is popularized by the AO group here. There's a, there's a really good uh, resource on their website uh, for this. And this is basically what it looks like. It's put on the lateral, um, the anterolateral kind of surface of the humerus with locking screws into the head and then cortical screws and locking screws into the shaft. So the key steps for this, you've basically got to expose the fracture without disrupting the blood supply. So you've got to know what the blood supply is if you're going to be fixing these uh, fractures. You've really got to reduce these anatomically. There's almost no point in doing an OIF, which is an open internal fixation, where you basically just create stability, but you haven't reduced anything uh, because the outcome is thought to be related to the quality of the reduction, like with many things in trauma. Um, you put loads of sutures into the rotator cuff, sutures into the subscap, sutures into the supraspinators, sutures into the infraspinators, and then you tie those sutures either together 
or ideally through the plate and then together uh, to supplement your fixation. And you should, you should always use an angular stable uh, locking plate device. And there are many on the market. Uh, so just a few uh, steps from the AO website. If you, if, no, uh, if you guys are not aware of this, if you go on AO surgery, if you Google AO surgery reference, and um, there's a fantastic, fantastic website. There's also an app that accompanies it that has a lot of the principles around a lot of fractures from head to toe. Um, so basically this is what you're doing. And so actually the AO website has three sutures. I have put at least five or six. Uh, usually what happens is you end up putting that, first, that number two suture in and then you pull on it and then you put one even deeper to it because you're trying to grab as much of the rotator cuff tendon as possible. You do the same with the um, infraspinatus and still you've got a good grip and that helps you basically manipulate and joystick a lot of those fragments uh, when you're trying to get the reduction. So you then may tie them together or you may tie them through the plate and then you may reduce it and hold it with K-wires and put your K-wires somewhere outside of um, outside of where you're going to put the plate so they don't interfere. Um, this is what the plate looks like. It's designed to sit just behind the bicipital groove and a bit lower from the tip of the GT to avoid impingement. It's very important you put it in the right place. It sits a lot more anterior than you think it does. Um, it's quite shocking. So identify the biceps, uh, but do not dissect it out because you'll disrupt the blood supply um, and put the plate just, just um, a few mils behind it. And then you basically just bang the screws in. And you're trying to get a nice spread into the humeral head to create this, uh, this kind of construct um, and then fix the screws in the shaft. Now these two screws are thought to be essential. Um, and I actually, when I do these, I put the chimney uh, into those holes and I put those KYs in pretty early on uh, because that's one of the ways of determining the height uh, of where to put the plates. Because for me, the most important thing is to get these car car screws on the car car because they're very important for preventing displacement, particularly varus displacement. And so they've got to really sit in the right place, which is where it's shown there. So I've got a quick five minute video on the delta pectoral probes because um, I think that's relevant. Hello, this is Mustafa Rashid giving a turbo lecture on the delta pectoral approach to the glenohumeral joint. Is that a lecture within a lecture? So when asked about any surgical approach, I would always preface your answer with a statement such as, in an appropriately marked, consented, and anesthetized patient, and after completing the WHO checklist, I would and then begin giving your answer in a systematic way. You can use any system. The system that I like involves mentioning the position of the patient, the internervous plane, if there is one, what structures are at risk, the landmarks for the skin incision, the planes for the superficial and deep dissection, and any additional maneuvers that will allow you to visualize certain parts of the anatomy or pathology a bit better. So the delta pectoral approach is performed usually in the beach chair position, but it can also be done in a supine position. You just need to become familiar with your own um, beach chair attachments for your operating table, and just be aware of some key elements, such as the head has to be secure in a, a position of comfort, and that the hips and knees should be bent um, to relax the hamstrings and sciatic nerve. So the delta pectoral approach is an intermuscular plane um, between the deltoid and the pec major. It's also an internervous plane because these two muscles are supplied by different nerves. The deltoid being supplied by the axillary nerve and the pec major being supplied by the medial and lateral pectoral nerves. So the structures at risk include the phallic vein, which is often used as a landmark to find the delta pectoral groove. It lies in a uh, stripe of fat between the deltoid and pec major. The muscular cutaneous nerve can be injured with overzealous medial retraction of the conjoint tendon. And the axillary nerve can be injured if working just inferior to the glenoid neck or in the posterolateral aspect of the humerus. So the skin incision landmarks go between the tip of the coracoid process to the insertion of the deltoid on the deltoid tuberosity. Superficial dissection involves retracting these two muscles and identifying the clavipectoral fascia, which is then incised just lateral to the conjoint tendon. Please be aware that at this level, the coracobrachialis is still a muscle, whilst the short head of biceps is very much a tendon. And so when you're doing this approach, it'll often look like that you're incising the edge of the conjoint tendon, 
when in reality there's a little bit of um, product brachialis lateral to that. And so it's often a lot more lateral than you think. The deep dissection really does depend on what your what operation you're doing. If you're doing a um, total shoulder replacement, for example, you may do a subscapularis tenotomy or a lesser tuberosity osteotomy. If you're doing a proximal humerus fracture, open reduction and terminal fixation, you may actually ignore the um, subscapularis on the lesser tuberosity and leave that attached and try to find the fracture plane between the lesser and greater tuberosity, which is often a common fracture plane that's seen. But one thing that's important to do at this stage is to mention that there are branches ascending from the uh, anterior humeral circumflex vessels, which uh, should be ligated at this point as they can uh, provide excessive bleeding if cut without ligation. Mentioning things like that will often demonstrate to the person asking you the question that you've seen this approach before and that you're aware of some of the key steps. So this is quite a common step. Uh, we often ligate these uh, branches uh, before doing something with the subscapularis, for example. So that's a summary of the anterior anatomy of the glenohumeral joint. Once you expose the capsule, you can do a capsulotomy of any type, usually longitudinal. And so to summarize, the delta pectoral approach is done with an incision in the delta pectoral groove between the coracoid process and the deltoid tuberosity. It's an internervous plane between the axillary nerve supplying the deltoid and the medial and lateral pectoral nerve supplying the pet major. The structures at risk include the cephalic vein, musculocutaneous nerve and axillary nerve. Superficially, you retract between the deltoid and pec major. And deep dissection involves retracting the conjoint tendon medially to expose the subscapularis. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, I hope that was clear. I can send anyone that video if they, if they wish to have it. Um, another treatment modality is the IM nail. I'm not gonna to talk too much about this, but there are basically two types, a curved and a straight. A straight is thought to be better but it goes through the articular surface of the humeral head, but it's, better, it's a more stable construct. These are rarely used in the UK, but they are coming back into fashion, having new generation of nails designed specifically for these purposes. But you just need to know that it exists. Um, hemioarthroplasty, you're not gonna to talk too much about this, but essentially like you would um, do a hip hemioarthroplasty, you could do a humeral hemioarthroplasty. Um, but the problem with these is, is what happens here. So you can see serial x-rays um, of this patient that had a hemioplasty, the greatest tuberosity just disappears. And, and in this person, this shoulder is totally non-functional. Once the tuberosity has disappeared like that, there is nothing attached to the proximal humerus, nothing is powering the movement of that shoulder. And so the patient doesn't have much pain, they just can't, it's a non-functional shoulder. So you may as well not have operated on them. And so the, the use of hemioplasty because of how common this phenomenon is, is really going down in, in most of the Western world. Um, reverse total shoulder replacement is another uh, option. It's becoming very, very popular. Um, it's very popular in the elderly, essentially. No one really likes doing a reverse under the age of 70. Um, and so it's a bit like the total hip replacement in femoral neck fractures. If they're quite functionally quite good, um, a reverse can be fantastic, a really good operation because you take them out of pain relatively uh, sooner than they would if they had conservative treatment you're less uh, worried about mobilization, you get them going straight away. It's technically easier to expose um, the, the shoulder in this situation, but it's harder to position the humeral implant because if you get a lot of comminution at the neck you, and you're cementing a stem, you can put that at any height. A bit like when you're doing a, um, a total hip replacement for a knot. It's actually really, it's a much harder operation for getting the tension right, the soft tissue balance right. Um, than, than if you're doing it for uh, arthritis, for example. Um, luckily for us, there's a multi-center randomized control trial that's evaluating this question. So we're com essentially comparing whether a reverse um, uh, versus hemiarthroplasty versus uh, fixation, I believe, um, is, is, is superior to one another. So uh, the answer will be coming soon. Um, like I said, in most of the Western world, the incidence, the use of hemiarthroplasty is going down and uh, there's a massive increase in the uh, increase in reverse for fracture. So this is the case in Germany. This is the case in Australia. Um, and uh, actually, non-operative treatment in this study was still the mainstay of treatment. 
Um, so to answer that question, uh, most people get away with non-operative treatment for these injuries. Um, but in the very elderly with really bad fractures, a reverse is quite a good option, although not yet evidence-based, but certainly becoming very popular. And in the NJR, I believe a, a third of reverses done are done for trauma. Um, there is one question about whether it doesn't matter doing a reverse when they suit, when they have their fracture or can you wait to see how they do? They might be fine. Uh, and if they're unhappy with their outcome a year down the line, you can then do a reverse then. And this meta-analysis granted of, of kind of level four studies, only four studies included were comparative studies. So level three and above, uh, there were no RCTs. It basically showed no difference, but you know, I'd, I'd take that with a pinch of salt because there isn't really much good evidence to suggest, to suggest acute versus delayed. But one center that I've worked in, they don't operate anyone who's elderly with approximate human fractures, but they all get an appointment at six months and they get counseled on whether they're happy or unhappy with their shoulder. Um, and if they're unhappy, they get counseled about a reverse at that stage. Some people say it's technically harder to do because you get malunions. Um, but actually, if you get a lot of experience and of all the reverses for fracture you're doing in a year, then you probably get quite good at doing it. Um, you can't really talk about proximal human fracture without talking about um, this paper, which uh, I wouldn't be too surprised if they asked you a question about this in your ST3 interviews, because it's such a big landmark paper. So you do need to know it. It's, it's well worth the read. It was uh, done by uh, Amar Rangan, who's a professor in South Tees in the North East. It's published in JAMA, which is a journal of um, um, American medicine or something, American Medical Association. So it's for like impact factor of like 30 or something. It's, it's, it's huge. It's one of the big journals in 2015. And it's essentially a large multi-center pr pragmatic randomized controlled trial comparing any type of surgery to a uh, conservative treatment for all uh, displaced acute proximal humerus fractures and those over 16 years old. Um, and uh, in the, what they were looking at is the Oxford shoulder score at two years, that was the primary outcome. So in the surgical group, a lot of people get this wrong and they didn't all have plates. Uh, the majority had plates, some had hemis, some had iron nails and five had other, which would include like K wires or just suture fixation basically. Um, and what they essentially found was that there was no difference at uh, 24 months in terms of Oxford shoulder score, which is a functional outcome measure used in the shoulder. There are a lot of common criticisms that you may hear from your bosses and from registrars uh, in, you know, who like fixing proximal human fractures, and I put myself in that group. But the, you know, the, this this is a very good study, and um, anyone who knows anything about research methodology will know that this is a very well conducted. Uh, but one of the criticisms is they mainly included old people, uh, and that's just simply not true. I don't think those people who say that even read the paper, uh, because yes, there were more elderly people, because that's just who these fractures are often seen in. But actually, you can see in the split here. I'm not sure if this is going to work. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see my, uh, no, no, never mind. Um, so you can see in the surgical and the non-surgical group, there was a significant proportion of patients under the age of 65. There weren't many 20 year olds, for example, but actually there were a significant number of 40 and 50 year olds as well. Um, another criticism is they didn't have many three and four part fractures. They didn't have many four part fractures, but they had a good number of three part fractures. And you can see that from the data. Um, I, I think a lot of people criticize these studies without ever actually reading it, just reading the abstract. But um, yeah, they didn't have many four-part fractures, but actually you don't see that many four-part fractures in, in common practice. Um, and so they, they, did, they did include, it wasn't all just, you know, simple two-part fractures that didn't need an operation, basically, uh, or fractures that would have done well no matter what you did. It was a good representation of a lot of these injuries. Um, <clears throat> a lot of people say surgery wasn't done by a specialist upper limb surgeon. Well, that's just the NHS, right? You know, the, at the time when the study was conducted, um, it, a trauma list is a trauma list, right? You can't have a study where you're asking only the top 10 shoulder trauma surgeons in the country to fix these patients, because that's not what happens in the NHS. And that's why um, there's a lot of external validity in these kind of uh, pragmatic trials. And then the final criticism is the trial was too pragmatic. And this always makes me laugh because anyone who says that doesn't really understand what the term pragmatic means in the context of research. Um, it's not, it's basically a misunderstanding of the terminology uh, and a misunderstanding of the difference between clinical effectiveness and clinical efficacy. I'm not going to go into this because we're already running a bit late. Um, but uh, pragmatism is a good thing because it increases the external validity and the application of the results to, to the wider health service. Um, Quick study, there's an RCT, not very 
large, but it did compare delta pectoral approach versus the McKinsey superlateral approach, deltoid split approach. And they actually found surprisingly that um, the SF12 scores and the quick dash scores were better with the delta pectoral approach, which actually in the UK, most people would fix approximately fractures with a field loss plate using a delta pectoral approach, which is why I showed you the video of it. So the take home message for this is proximal human fractures have a wide spectrum of fracture pattern, patient demographic and possible treatment options. You've got to be very astute in your clinical assessment. Don't forget to assess neuro neurology and vascular status and look for whether the head's in joint or not and get a CT if you're concerned. And non-operative management is the mainstay of treatment for many people. Okay, that's, I'm going to break that very quickly and then I'm going to move on. I might have to carry on without taking questions on that section because I've gone way, way over time. I apologize. Is that okay, Shamali? Uh, yes, yes, of course. All right, so let's go on to glenohumeral dislocations. So I will say that this is a huge topic in itself as well. And I'm only really going to focus on um, traumatic anterior um, acute uh, shoulder dislocations. So these are the objectives. We're going to talk about what stabilizes the glenohumeral joint, how to classify dislocations, what are the pertinent clinical features, and what are the associated lesions that lead to recurrent instability, and uh, what factors guide management. So we can see here from these two uh, animations, uh, you can see on the left, the glenoid fossa is a very small thing compared to the humeral head and it's very flat. It's only three to four mils deep. Um, and it's, you know, it's not much of a socket, right? And so that it confers a lot of instability, but it also allows a lot of range of motion. On the right, you can see that there's a, a, a labrum, a glenoid labrum, which is a ring of cartilage around the glenoid fossa, which deepens it ever so slightly. And it's not really a bumper, which is what a lot of people think it is actually. What it is, is, is rich and proprioceptive nerve fibers that allow your brain to know where the center of the ball is compared to the center of the socket. And then there are some capsular structures around it, which are important static um, um, stabilizers. So you can see that here. So the important static stabilizer, aside from the labrum, are the IGHL, of which the anterior band is more important than the posterior band when it comes to anterior instability. And so this structure, the anterior band of the IGHL, basically becomes taut when you externally rotate and abduct, okay? And ironically, when you have a dislocation, you've torn off the labrum and the capsule from the glenoid fossa in that corner, in that kind of five o'clock corner that you can see there on that view. Um, and it, so when you come up into this position, you've got nothing there in terms of static stabilizers to keep your um, humeral head centered. And so that's the at-risk position. So if someone asks you, what should I avoid having had a dislocation, you say, in the acute phase, avoid doing anything like that. So like throwing a tennis ball or hailing a cab or whatever. Um, the rotator cuff is a very important dynamic stabilizer. So you can imagine there's a big ball and a, and a shallow socket. So you need muscles to keep the head centered. And that's the primary function of the rotator cuff. It is not to move um, the humerus. It's mainly to center the humerus onto the um, glenoid and also create a compression effect. So concavity compression where it pulls the, the humeral head into the glenoid fossa throughout all, all range of motion. And you can consider it as akin to a kind of a seal uh, balancing a ball. So the ball's a humeral head, the seal is the scapula, and the nose is the glenoid fossa. So you can imagine the seal, in order to keep the ball on its nose, has got to continuously move around. And what I didn't talk about, is there are also scapular muscles that attach the scapula to the, um, to the thorax, which also fire to position the scapula in, in space to allow the glenoid fossa to be roughly pointing upwards in this, in this analogy to keep the ball on it, right? So that's, that's what you need to know. So how do we classify this? Well, you can classify it by direction. You can classify it um, in this way, which is uh, Frederick Matson's classification from like the eighties, I believe, which is Tubbs and Ambry. Um, and they're not, you know, names of his pets or anything. So Tubbs stands for traumatic dislocation, unidirectional, bank heart lesion, and we'll talk about what that is shortly. And those patients, the treatment are, is often surgery. And then there's another group, which is uh, another kind of common presentation, which is AMBRI, which is atraumatic, multidirectional, bilateral often involvement. So both shoulders, rehab is the treatment. And if they fail rehab, you do an inferior capsular shift. Um, that was superseded, especially in this country by Ian Bailey at Stanmore, who came up with this classification, which is known as the Stanmore Triangle, which is later been adapted to the Stanmore Prism, and it's going to keep going until it becomes the Stanmore Multiverse. But essentially, you've got three polar types. You've got type one, which is 
the vast, vast majority of people that you will ever see in A&E, right? They're a young person, they have a significant fall and they fall onto a kind of an abducted um, and forward flexed arm and they dislocate. Um, and they have a bank heart lesion. And they, if they're young and they have a recurrent instability, they'll often have surgery. But then you've got another polar type who are just a little bit lax. Um, they may not have a lot of trauma, very simple. You know, someone bumped into me on the bus and I dislocated, but they may also have a structural uh, lesion um, and they occasionally may need an operation, but there's often less trauma uh, in those patients and you've got to be a bit wary or right? they're not so obvious to, to treat and get a good outcome with the operation. And then you've got type three who you should just always stay away from, right? These um, are a grossly misunderstood group. They're essentially muscle patterners. So they essentially um, have an imbalance of, of either the pec major or the lat dorsi muscles. And they're essentially contracting so hard they're pulling <coughs> the humeral head out of socket. And they never, never should have an operation ever, unless that operation is some um, something that's like salvaged that where someone else has operated on them like 20 times and they, they you know that you're trying to salvage this situation uh, but the mainstay of treatment is to not operate on those so uh, i'm going to quickly look at this look at this guy he's diving for the ball he's playing basketball and he's 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 outstretched he's abducted and forward flexed and i want, I want you to notice I mean, he's obviously got a lot of pain but watch this next video look at his shoulder so that bony prominence that you see is, is a chromium because his humeral head has gone anterior and inferior so you can often spot a dislocated shoulder from miles away from the other end of the A&E because the most lateral thing on your shoulder contour in a dislocation is the acromion, when normally it's the greater tuberosity. Normally you have that nice uh, deltoid muscle attached onto, around the greater tuberosity. Um, and, and so it's not a nice smooth contour, whilst in dislocation you see the, the very sharp uh, border of the lateral edge of acromion. Uh, this is another common mechanism. Look at the guy in the middle uh, in yellow. And as he lands, he's not landed outstretched and abducted. He's landed adducted, extended, and he's got a direct force to his elbow, not his shoulder, but he's grabbing his shoulder. So that's another common um, mechanism for dislocating. So those are the two common ways of doing it. And then uh, I just put this in for comedy value. Look at this guy, dislocates his left shoulder, throwing a, a right-handed punch, and it's now dislocated. It's out. So he's probably got a, a previous instability, or he may have a, a type 2 instability. And then do not do this. Right. Do not do that. But his, his mate really wants to continue the fight. So he, um, he just pops it back in for him and then he thanks him for it. But I wouldn't recommend doing that because um, uh, that's quite painful. Uh, but in the very acute phase, you can get away with that occasionally. But just don't just don't do it. Just wait for the power Um So when you take in a history, you really want to assess how much trauma is there. Right. If it was very minor trauma, you know, I just got bumped. Uh, I just hit the, the corner of the door frame. Be aware. Right. Because they may be a type two instability. Or it may be that someone had a previous episode of instability and they're now so unstable, they take very little in the way of trauma to dislocate their shoulder. So you need to know if it's first time or recurrent, how old were they when they first dislocated? Always examine the neurological status and particularly the auxiliary nerve, but also the whole brachial plexus. It takes two seconds to do. And then you could assess for generalized laxity using the Baton score. I'm not gonna go into too much, um, but you can look that up. It's basically a measure for hyperlaxity. I'm not gonna talk about how to reduce dislocations, just very briefly, just keep it simple, right? There are lots of different um, techniques. There's traction methods versus leverage techniques. There's, you know, two broad categories. I prefer this technique, which is Matson's traction counter traction method. It works pretty much all the time. It, there's no risk of causing a break or an auxiliary nerve palsy. Um, it's just very simple. And, and you, one thing you must do is always assess the neurology before and after and the vascular status of the limb before and after doing anything. Very, very important. Um, and if it fails, it usually fails because of two reasons. Either inadequate sedation. So if the patient looks like this and they're having a conversation with you about being in the pub 10 minutes ago, then they're not sedated enough, right? And so a lot of A&E registrars are very, um, very uh, timid with their sedation. They're not particularly that confident with airway maneuvers. And so they'll give like 0.5 milligrams of midazolam and you'll end up just you know having a conversation with the patient whilst you're pulling on their shoulder that's not the right way to do it um so you need to have an appropriately sedated patient um, and so that's one of the reasons of failure the other reason is impatience right in order for you to get the shoulder back in the deltoid and all the other muscles that cross the shoulder joint have to be relaxed and eccentrically contracting right so they've got to be elongating for you to be able to get the shoulder back in and the only way you do that is if you 
provide sustained traction to engage the inverse stretch reflex, which is a Golgi body tendon mediated reflex. So the, when you first pull, you get a stretch reflex. We all remember that from Starling's law of the heart. You pull on something, it contracts. But if you keep pulling on it, especially a skeletal muscle, it then will elongate and relax. That's the inverse stretch reflex. But that takes minutes, you know, it takes five or six minutes to do that. So you've got to have sustained, gentle traction and counteraction for you to engage the inverse stretch reflex and get this thing back in joint. Always confirm with repeat x-rays, give the patient a sling for comfort only, okay? You can tell them, you can take the sling whenever, take it off whenever you like, don't wear it all the time. It's not a treatment, it's just for comfort because we've been pulling on your shoulder. Um, make the refractory clinic follow up for one or two weeks and you may not be involved, but in the refractory clinic, they may arrange some imaging and there's a lot of controversy about when to image and who to image and what imaging studies you need to do, but I'm not gonna go into that too much. So question number uh, three, very quickly, is um, the essential lesion in shoulder instability is detachment of the middle of the humeral ligament. True or false? Quick poll. I wanna get to put this on for 30 seconds and then we need to move on. I'm so sorry. I promise I wouldn't overrun and I'm definitely gonna overrun. Okay, Charmaine, sure, true or false? The essential lesion. The thing that pretty much everyone gets with a traumatic answer is that false, correct. That is the correct answer. Um, the essential lesion was described by this man, Arthur Bankart. He was a surgeon in Northwest London. He described it in, in the BMJ in 1923. And essentially it's an anterior inferior detachment of the glenoid labrum, which he referred to as the glenoid ligament. And he basically got into a bit of a huff because everyone, he felt that everyone was missing the point of shoulder dislocation, that they weren't seeing what the pathology was. And he was actually right. He basically said, look, you know, if you take the coracoid off and look directly at the glenoid rim, this bit of tissue is, is not in continuity, is not attached to the glenoid fossa. And if you do something to reattach the capsule to the glenoid, then the patients don't get instability. And he felt very strongly about that. And that was in the 1920s. Um, he published a couple of papers on that at that time and, and it, it stood the test of time. So Arthur Bankart, uh, he was a um, surgeon at Mount Vernon Hospital. Interesting thing about him is he died operating, which is um, a glorious way to go. Um, but uh, he was he was really a kind of like a, an amazing, amazing sort of surgeon person and um, really a genius. Um, and if you want to know a bit more about him, there's a really good paper I'd recommend, uh, personal plug, um, but it talks about the history of Arthur Bankart and the Bankart repair. Um, there are lots of associated lesions. They all have weird acronyms. A lot of the time you're, you're scratching your head thinking, I don't really know what they're talking about here. So I'm going to quickly give you a quick rundown of what they are. So you've got a bony bank heart, which is basically the anterior inferior labrum detached with a bit of a rim of bone, just a tiny little bit of bone of variable size. That's a bony bank heart. So it's not just a soft tissue, but there's a bit of bone that's gone with it. A hill sax lesion is basically a, a divot in the, um, in the humeral head, in the posterior part of the humeral head. And that's when the humeral head dislocates and it bangs against the anterior glenoid rim. It was described by um, um, David Hill and, no, not David Hill, Harold Hill and Maurice Sachs in 1940. They're both radiologists. And um, there's an ALPSA lesion, which stands for anterior labral periosteal sleeve avulsion, which essentially is, is exactly as it sounds. You get the periosteal sleeve going down the glenoid neck avulsed with the, um, the glenoid uh, labrum. There's such a thing as a GLAD lesion, which essentially is not just the periosteum, but even cartilage on the face of the glenoid has also gone off with that fragment. Um, there's a HAGL, which is a humeral avulsion of glenohumeral ligament. It's essentially that inferior hammock, rather than coming off from the, the glenoid side, um, the IGHL has come off from the humeral side. And that's a really important thing to pick up. And there's great gerosity fractures, there's uh, neck of humerus fractures, and there's rotator cuff tears, and usually people over the age of 40. So all, those are all the associated lesions of the dislocation. As a general rule of thumb, the more trauma that went into the dislocation, the more likely you get these associated lesions. And be aware of the patient with a minimal history of trauma and no hill sacs on the x-ray or the scan, because they're probably not a type one instability patient. Um, and generally speaking, if it has an acronym, the rate of instability recurrently is, 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 is higher. Um, you need to be aware that you can lose bone in having multiple dislocations. And that's very, very important. It can be either from the glenoid side or from the humeral side. It's often underappreciated. If you're ever concerned, get a CT scan. That's the gold standard. 
Um, and a lot of the time when a bank heart repair, just a soft tissue repair fails because they've underappreciated there's a lot of bone loss there. And this was first brought to the attention of the world by Steve Burkhart in 2000. This is a seminal paper. If you're ever interested in shoulders, you've you know, got to read this. He collaborated with a guy called Joe DeVere in Cape Town and basically looked at his series and was like, um, you know, a lot of the people that failed had a lot of bone loss that we noticed intraoperatively. Um, uh, but how much is too much, we still don't know. So going back to this, the management uh, based on the Stanmore triangle is surgery for most type one instability, um, occasional surgery for type two, but you a lot more hesitant to offer them surgery and physio for type three. So you got these four people, right? You got Bob on the left, you've got Brad uh, on the second left, you've got Mike in the middle and you got Owen Farrell on the right. Who gets what treatment and why? Well, I'm gonna tell you. The options are bank heart repair, latter J, cuff repair or conservative treatment. So Brad, Brad is likely to get a bank heart repair. So it's an arthroscopic procedure. It's reattachment of the glenoid labrum uh, because he's young, you know, he's in early twenties. This has got a high risk of dislocating again. Uh, Owen Farrell, because he's a contact athlete, um, some people would offer a latter J and I'll explain what that is later. It's a bony procedure, even though they don't have a lot of bone loss because they're a bit concerned because the rate of failure with a soft tissue procedure in contact athletes is much higher. Mike gets a uh, cuff repair because actually he doesn't care that his glenoid labrum is no longer attached after dislocation. The thing he's going to miss is his cuff not being intact because he's 55 and he's, he really needs a rotator cuff. So he's going to get a cuff repair. You can ignore the glenoid labrum and, and Mike. And Bob is going to get physio. Uh, Bob is likely to, even if he has a rotator cuff tear, you know, he's 90 years old. He probably had the cuff tear before he had his dislocation. So no need to offer him any surgery. So quick question, we're not gonna do this as a poll because I'm running out of time, but what is the rate of recurrence after a first time traumatic anterior shoulder dislocation in a 27 year old male? Uh, those are your options. I'm gonna give you a few seconds. I'm gonna tell you what the answer is. Um, have a think about that. And in fact, if we narrow it down, this is the rate of recurrence in the next two years after the first dislocation. If you're 27 years old and you're a bloke, your rate of recurrence for traumatic sh anterior shoulder dislocation is exactly 50%. We're going to move on from that. Um, and this came from uh, Mike Robinson's paper in Edinburgh, where he basically uh, built on the work of Leonard Hevelius in Sweden, who basically demonstrated that there's a strong correlation between the age that you first dislocate and, um, and your rate of recurrence. And so what um, uh, Robinson describes in the first two years after your first dislocation, you've got um, a 78% risk of recurrence if you're a bloke, 45% if you're a female. And at 27, I remember 27 because it's really easy numbers to remember. It's basically half risk of another dislocation in the next two years and a quarter if you're a woman. And it goes down with age. So uh, very quickly, I'm gonna show you uh, a video of Peter Millett, um, who's someone I went to visit. He also came to the POT meeting, a very famous shoulder surgeon in Stedman Clinic in, um, in Vail, Colorado. I'm just going to show you the lesion. This is basically him looking down to look for a haggle. So the haggle would be would be here, would be detached from this, from the humerus, and he doesn't have a haggle. But you can see he's going to pop the probe in uh, in a second. Um, he's testing the superior labrum there, but you'll see uh, there's the, there's your hill sacs, that big divot that we talked about. And he's just debriding a bit of the frayed labrum, and you can see there is, a, <coughs> let me show you there inside there the labor is totally detached so once you mobilize it um you debride the, the glenoid you graft the tissue and you're basically trying to reattach the glenoid anyway, no time for that you need to know what a latage is it's basically where you take the conjoined tendon and the coracoid you osteotomize it and you pass it through the subscap and you bolt it to the front of the glenoid uh, and it's a bony procedure usually in the uk um uh, to uh, in revision cases or to address bone loss from the glenoid side. Or in France, if you've ever had a dislocation, you probably get one of these. Um, you may also have a remplissage, which is basically um, this thing here, where you're basically uh, bolting the uh, capsule and the infraspinatus into the hill sacs defect to stop that divot from engaging on the glenoid rim. Uh, you don't need to worry too much about that, but that's what remplissage is. It, is it means French, it's French to fill in basically. You do a conjoint tendon transfer, which very few people do, where you just take the conjoint tendon and not the bone. And you can just take a bit of bone from the iliac crest and bolt it on the front of the glenoid. If there's a lot of bone missing, that's called the Eden Hebene procedure. 
And then attack two instability. If they've got a very lacked capsule, you can double breast the capsule. So you can do a T capsulotomy and you can put pants over vest uh, of the capsule. A little bit of evidence. Um, auxiliary nerve is very, very common. It's the most common nerve affected 42% of the time. And if you look at EMG of everyone that dislocates their shoulder, 48% uh, will have some axonal loss on EMG, but around half of those will actually have a clinical detectable um, nerve deficit. And it's usually transient and temporary, but interestingly, it increases significantly with age. Uh, and I'm going to cover this too much, but essentially a, a very famous professor in uh, Sendai, Tokyo in uh, Japan, uh, looked at whether putting dislocators into an external rotation uh, brace helps. And in his study, his RCT showed that there was a less recurrence when they did this, but this hasn't ever been replicated in Western studies. And it's largely related to compliance. And this is quite small numbers as well. So it's, it's not common practice. There is a Cochrane review on instability, which basically says that primary surgery for young adults who are male and high demand, usually after the first dislocation, don't wait. You know, in the 80s, we used to wait for multiple dislocations. There's no need to wait now. Uh, and there's no evidence of which treatment is better, but most people do an arthroscopic bank car repair. And I would strongly encourage you have a read of this. It's basically some guidelines produced by the British Elbow and Shoulder Society uh, with the BOA, and it's freely available on their website. Um, it's where that table was taken from, and it gives you a nice algorithm for how you should manage people, um, how to treat them in fracture clinic, how to treat them if you're a GP and referring them uh, on. So that's what we covered. Thank you very much. Um, I'm more than happy to be contacted if anyone uh, wants any further information, um, any advice, any career advice, any sort of tutelage or whatever, I'm more than happy to, to be emailed. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I overran. Thank you very much, Mr. Rashid. Um, that was a brilliant talk, thank you. We'll just have a two minute break before Mr. Nicaresti gets started. So uh, we'll, two minutes and we'll get started at 20.08. Thank you very much.